Hey everybody, is this the beginning of the end for some major banks? We're going to talk about it today. A lot of people have been putting this out there saying this is the end or the beginning of the end or the beginning of the bank implosion as we see 20,000 layoffs occur this year just in the top five biggest banks. Wall Street banks quietly lay off 20,000 employees amid economic uncertainties. Well, it's more than just uncertainty. Uh, in fact, I'm certain that there's some big problems in the banks that we're going to see unfold here uh, as we go into the last part of the year. And of course, in 2020, when everything's going to fall apart, uh, but it's definitely not uncertainty if you just look at all the information and the evidence here. And let's go right over here to the Business Times. And this is how they put it. Despite recent data surpassing expectations, they're talking about the profits, filings from the banking sector reveal that Excluding JP Morgan Chase, the top five banks have collectively laid off 20,000 employees this year. The layoffs might intensify in the future. I think if we could take the word might out of there. Um, they absolutely will intensify. And it goes on here. It continues. Analysts believe that besides high interest rate environment, increasing operational costs, the significant reason for layoffs is the reduced rate of job hopping among financial professionals this year, leading to an unexpected surplus. And bank staff. Well, that's certainly part of it. And just think about this when people are job hopping, um, it gets chalked up as a job added. But then we've got to subtract the job that was lost when people left the job. But people, that actually is just scratching the surface. We've got big problems now with banks and their balance sheet, all of these loans, all of these securities that are underwater because they were issued at such low interest rates. So we've got to think about that and, and critically think about. What kind of position and what kind of bigger troubles are ahead within the big banks? Now, let's take a look at some of the numbers here between these big banks. And if we bring up this chart right here, we see that JP Morgan Chase actually has increased their employee count. But the banks after that, Citigroup, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, they've all cut staff. And if you add them up, it's a total of 20,000. It would have been a lot worse if you would have taken JP Morgan out of there because they actually increased the number of employees there. So why did JP Morgan increase the number of employees and these other banks cut employees or fired staff? Well, this could be part of it right here. This is out of CNN. The latest on JP Morgan Chase takeover of First Republic Bank. Remember, Chase went in, JP Morgan went in, took over uh, this failed bank here, First Republic, and took on all of their assets, of course, but also took on some of their employees, not all of their employees. Remember, here's what happened. About a thousand First Republic Bank employees got laid off, but they did take on some of the staff as they had all the additional capital and customer base that they had to deal with. Now, just think about how much worse it would be and could be if we didn't have these big mega banks coming to the rescue of some of these smaller and regional banks. It could be so much worse. I mean, we might see layoffs, 50,000, 100,000, who knows? Remember, so many jobs that were added to the economy over the past 10 and 15 years were only made possible by rock bottom interest rates and super easy money. Now those things have changed. Money's not so easy. People are having a, a very difficult time qualifying for loans, right? So we're going to talk about this more on the other side. We're going to do a quick word here from our sponsor. You know, we don't have very many sponsors on this channel. That's because I only choose sponsors that I would use myself. And here's something I'm invested in. Take a listen. We'll see you in about one minute on the other side. China's real estate bubble is absolutely collapsing. In 2008, when the subprime mortgage crisis nearly ended modern capitalism, housing was 8% of US GDP, while housing is 25% of China. This is an epic meltdown and it's just the beginning. Meanwhile, in the United States, inflation is so high that the Federal Reserve is talking about raising interest rates further, choking the credit out of the economy completely. Everything is expensive. Gold is perfect for this environment, but it is at near all-time highs already. So I want to present a company called Gold Mining Inc. trading on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker GLDG. The reason is that this company trades at multi-year lows, extremely cheap. Their gold resources are only worth a dollar per ounce. If you go to wealthresearchgroup.com slash cheap gold, there's an entire presentation explaining how this company is effectively 80 or 90% more discounted than anything out there. 
If you're bullish on gold, I urge you to stop everything you're doing and download this carefully drafted report now. Gold Mining Inc. is a junior resource company trading under the symbol GOLD on the TSX Venture Exchange and GLDLF on the OTC markets. The company is focused on the acquisition, exploration, and development of resource stage gold project in the Americas Gold Mining dot com link down in the description of this video and folks when it comes to this bank implosion i truly feel like this is just the tip of the iceberg i think it's going to get a lot a lot worse uh, we have the central bank out there talking about keeping rates higher for longer um will they hold to their word well we'll have to see but if that does happen we're only going to see more pain remember when rates stay higher it's only a matter of time before people carrying debt and I must remind you, that's most people. It only is a matter of time before people carrying debt um, can't make ends meet anymore. Unless we continue to see uh, wages increase to keep up with this cost of living. And of course, what are we seeing now? Well, we're not seeing that for the most part because we have people going on strike. Everywhere you look, there's strikes happening because people are demanding higher wages. They're not making enough to keep up with this cost of living. And if rates stay high, that's only going to spell uh, more pain and more disaster. Now, when people are talking about the bank implosion is just beginning, look at news like this. Bank of America closes 21 branches in one week at the same time as Wells Fargo shutters 15. Folks, this is just in one week, this month here, October 2023. So this is a more a signals and more signs that something's going seriously wrong in the banking system. Of course, they came out and they tried to say this was just people using online banking. Folks, online banking has been around for decades. I remember paying bills online um, when I first got on the internet in the late 90s. I mean, a long time ago um, through through my bank. You know, this is not anything new. Of course, the websites are a lot nicer now and a lot more functionality. But online banking has been around forever. So to blame this on online banking is a completely, I think, ridiculous thing to try to say. All right. So what do we need to do here? Uh, well, I think we really need to strap on and prepare for a changing world, right? So many people, especially younger people, they just thought that things were going to be like this forever, that interest rates were always low. Well, thank goodness that's not forever because look at the asset bubbles that were blown up because of the ultra low interest rates and the easy money, right? So things had to change at some point. And a lot of us here, including myself, uh, but a, a lot of people looking at the economy and talking about the economy even financial gurus, a lot of people were shocked and surprised at how long um, interest rates were kept at rock bottom when they saw the cost of going up. They saw the cost of living going up and all these asset uh, prices being blown up into bubble territory. Now people somehow think that these bubbles aren't going to deflate. Uh, they feel like there's going to be some sort of action taken like in 2020 where they didn't let the markets come down. Uh, even the stock market, it came down very briefly. It came down pretty fast, though, uh, and 40% correction overall. But it was also the biggest recovery that we had ever seen in stocks. Uh, the same thing for the house housing market. It didn't come down, but the actions taken by the powers that be prevented uh, markets from imploding. Otherwise, you would have saw uh, the price of rents plummet. Uh, you would have saw the price of homes plummet. But all the actions that were taken, all the rescue programs, you know, kept these prices elevated. And now we have this inflation problem that's not going away because why? Because the powers that be are afraid of deflation. They're afraid of a lower cost of living and they're afraid of lower prices. Why is that? Well, because bubbles and high prices make the economy look better, All right? While the bubble's being blown up, people are spending more and they look and they say, oh, look, the consumer's strong. Look at all this credit card spending. Uh, look at all this gross domestic product. When it's mostly people taking on debt, uh, swiping their credit cards and getting out, taking out loans and buying things that they normally would not afford to buy. So temporarily and for a certain period of time, yes, that makes the economy look very strong and they can put the numbers out there and all the, uh, the business news channels can talk about how great the economy is and the people out there working in public office, they can take credit for it. They can say, look at this growth. You know, we're doing an amazing job. But then finally, we get to the point where the cost of living just cannot be sustained by the general population. And that's where we're at right now. That's why we see defaults increasing wherever you look, foreclosures are increasing again, 
late credit card payments, higher loan payments, all increasing right now. No coincidence that this is uh, the end of the temporary uh, easy money, which didn't seem temporary for a while because it was 10 plus years. Again, at rock bottom rates and easy money. But there's something else that we have to look into here to add to this, because this could be a big part of what's causing banks to close so many branches and to lay off so many people. Banks are afraid right now at what's in the pipeline. What's in the pipeline? That's uh, the re-implementation of higher capital requirements for the banks, also known as the reserve requirement. Here's an article right here. Take a look at this article right here. U.S. banking regulators extend feedback window for a contentious capital proposal, right? So of course, banks are fighting against this. Banks are uh, lobbying and doing things to try to keep the zero reserve requirement in place, uh, also known as not having any capital in the bank deposits in order to make out, uh, in order to make loans or have people take out loans. Uh, U.S. banking regulators extend the feedback window. So, of course, they're delaying this because they know how big this could impact the banks. We also see articles like this trying to justify keeping the reserve requirement for banks at zero. A higher bank capital requirements would harm low income borrowers the most. So what would happen if banks uh, were required to keep more money in deposits before they made loans? Well, they'd have to be more picky on who they loaned out money to, including the people with the worst credit scores. And as this article points out, low income borrowers, right? So this is one of the ways uh, they're trying to justify uh, keeping the zero reserve requirement in place is they're going to say this is going to hurt borrowers. People won't be able to borrow money as easy, as easily as they are now. So if it's harder to get a loan, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, overall, it's a good thing because that means asset prices may start coming down. Remember when everybody can qualify for a loan, well, that's something that really pushes asset prices higher. When everybody can get a loan, prices skyrocket because there's so much more demand out there because everybody's qualifying for a loan. When it's very difficult to qualify for a loan, when banks have capital requirements and when it's not easy to get qualified to take out a bunch of money or to borrow a bunch of money, asset prices come down, right? So these things could cause a major deflation. And what happens in falling asset price scenario is banks don't need as much staff. Just look at all the layoffs just in the mortgage divisions of these banks right now. I think a big chunk of the 20,000 layoffs have been in the mortgage borrowing sector of these banks, the mortgage division, right? So expect more people getting fired slash layoffs. Remember, layoffs is just a nice way of saying People are getting fired. All right, folks, let me go ahead and put on my blue blocker economic vision glasses here and tell you what I see headed into the future. The last, uh, what, two and a half months here of 2023, closer to two months in a week, uh, into 2024. I see more of the same, but things continuing to get worse. What does that mean? More layoffs, um, more banks coming under a lot of pressure and even failing. Uh, if you look at the banks right now, all banks are um, insolvent because they've made so many loans. And now it's really difficult because they don't have a buyer for a lot of these loans. A lot of these uh, securities, mortgage-backed securities included, normally would just get bought up by investors, including the central bank. Well, now the central bank's actually reducing their balance sheet, right? So the buyer and lender of last resort uh, is not there like they used to be. Now, yes, they're still buying some uh, assets and loans because otherwise the whole thing would have come down a long time ago. They have to keep some of the buying going on. But overall, they're shedding assets and reducing their balance sheet. How much longer can that last? Well, we've seen the consequences in the bond market, in the higher rates. Look at mortgage rates right around 8% right now. And likely only going to go higher because none of the problems that are causing rates to spike right now, none of these problems have been solved. Of course, if you listen to uh, the talking heads from the central bank, like Jerome Powell, they'll tell you they're winning the war on inflation. Uh, therefore, we don't have to raise rates anymore, right? So they're using uh, the talking point that they that they're winning the war to justify no longer raising rates or keeping rates where they're at, also known as a pause. 
that's the way they're presenting it. But we really know the truth behind the situation is everything is imploding. Uh, people economically are barely getting by and they can't withstand higher rates than they already are. And do you think that if rates were still at rock bottom right now, that we would see 20,000 layoffs from the banks and see what 20 something Bank of America branches close in one week? You think we'd see all that if, rate, if rates were still at rock bottom? Probably not, but we'd see much higher asset prices. I think home prices would have went up double digits this year again. I think car prices would have went up double digits. So it is nice that we are seeing a little bit of sanity here where uh, banks are pulling back on their lending somewhat. And now we have the talk of this higher reserve requirement, cap, higher capital requirements. So some things are being done and a lot of people feared that even the things we're seeing right now, the tightening and the higher rates, um, the talk of capital requirements from the banks, there were fears that these things would never be uh, re-implemented, right? And that would have made prices continue to go up uh, even faster. That would have been a hyperinflation scenario. So thank goodness that didn't happen. Uh, so when it comes to being positive or negative, you know, people say that I'm negative. It's actually a positive thing. It's positive what's going on right now because otherwise asset prices would have went up even more. Just think about it. 0% interest rates or near zero Fed funds rate. Uh, how much higher would all these prices be uh, for everything right now? Just think about that, right? So that's actually a good thing that we are seeing you know, news like this with these banks. Um, people say it's negative. No, it's not negative. It's actually good. It just means that things are balancing out, right? When a bunch of jobs were created because of low interest rates, the opposite's going to happen when you raise interest rates. Jobs are going to be lost. Yes, it's sad, and no one wants to see people lose their jobs. But uh, on the other side, you have to maybe look for a job that's going to be something long-term stable, not something that's just in existence because of some easy money, rock-bottom interest rate uh, standard. And there's plenty, plenty of occupations out there right now that uh, people are in high demand. Uh, I know several construction companies in my area that are hiring. I also talk to insurance adjusters every day at my job because I work in finance. And insurance adjusters are saying how much of a shortage there is to get contractors to come out and repair homes, repair roofs, repair walls. Um, there's a huge shortage. In some areas, you're waiting months to get a contractor, especially in areas that see some sort of disaster we have a whole bunch of homes at once uh, that need to get repaired. Uh, some of these people are sadly waiting six months to a year to get their homes repaired. Uh, not many people can do this type of thing themselves when it comes to construction on a home or building a home or repairing a home. Uh, a lot of people are just elderly and they can't do it themselves, even if they knew how. So there's a lot of places out there that need uh, workers. So to see job losses in one area, don't think about that as a negative or that I'm reporting something negative. It's just the truth. It's just what's happening. That's why I've been trying to pull up more articles now to show you that I'm not just making this stuff up. But when there's job losses, think about the opportunities that might be out there for more steady jobs, more stable jobs that there's actually a shortage in right now. So think about things on a more positive uh, tone is what I'm trying to say. People you know, often call my channel doom and gloom, right? This is just economic reality is all it is in my opinion. You know what I'm saying? So people out there that think that I'm bringing doom and gloom or negativity, think about this. Maybe it's your perspective. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's not me. Maybe it's you uh, as the one who's thinking negatively. Because when I report this news, I just think of it as news. I don't think of it as positive or negative. It's just news. It's information. Um, but think about the flip side of it, right? Uh, now, maybe there's going to be more people going into positions that are actually needed. Uh, think about how much cheaper the cost of repairing or building a home in general. How much cheaper would that be if we didn't have such a shortage in labor? You would have more companies competing for the job, competing for the contract. Um, now, because the companies are so overwhelmed and overloaded with demand, of course, they're just going to have ultra high prices because they can do that. They're in a position of power when it comes to negotiating uh, a price to repair a home. When someone can't find a repair person uh, and it's going to take six to 12 months to repair their home, they're going to pay whatever they need to pay and possibly even take on debt to be able to pay for that repair person. Uh, but if we had an abundance of contractors competing for the work, competing to repair your home, then you're going to see 
lower cost, right? That's what competition does. And that's what a more balanced market should look like. And the cost of living would come down in a lot of different areas that I think a lot of people don't even uh, consider or think about, right? So there's a lot of positives to come with the negatives. That's basically what I want to put out there. So everybody, hope you guys like this report. What do you think about the bank implosion is what it's being called, 20,000 layoffs and counting, huge number of bank uh, branches closing just this month here within a short amount of time. Uh, what does it mean? Am I accurate? Or am I wrong? Please let me know down in comments and maybe add to something that I missed. Maybe there's a piece of the puzzle that I left out today. I can't throw everything into the, every video. So I'd like to hear from you down in comments. And thanks everybody for being here. Please give us a thumbs up. If you like what we talk about, it does help the channel, helps us stay alive. And don't forget to subscribe. You've got to be logged in to be able to give the thumbs up and subscribe. So if you're not logged in watching this video, please log in for me. Give us a thumbs up. It does help us and I can bring you more news, more economic data and analysis and tell you what I see in our future. Thanks, everybody. Bye now.